Shalom again, family. What if I told you that the biggest kept secret in this world is religion? What if I told you that the founders of modern religion are all Freemasons? What if I told you that the church you attend right now is steeped in doctrine, doctrinal ways that are founded upon Freemasonry concepts. You wouldn't believe me, would you? But let me let me prove it to you. Stick with me now. I'm going to embark on a series to decode, decipher and to expose religion in the Caribbean and across the world. For this first installment of the origins of Caribbean religion, I'm going to be dealing with a couple of points. First, we're going to find out who the Freemasons are. Then we're going to see the link between the founders and Freemasonry. Then we're going to find the current link between the pastors and Freemasonry. Then we're going to look at Freemasonry in terms of its effect on the society, in the educational system, the religious organizations, the government, and all the charity organizations that they have. In every warfare, the first rule of thumb is to know thine enemy. We first must discover what is Freemasonry, who are involved in Freemasonry, and what aspects of Freemasonry affect us here in our society. What you need to understand is that the devil has his own army flanked with knights, generals, principalities and masons. They are all around us invisible and unsuspected. Three million members of a secretive society older than the American Republic. For nearly 300 years, generations of Freemasons have obeyed their oaths, hidden their rituals, and maintained their silence until now. Who are these men, and these very few women? What bizarre ceremonies do they perform within their magnificent temples? What is the meaning of their costumes, their symbols, and their make-believe murders? What is the secret? See, that's what they don't want to talk about. There's nothing wrong with secrets. I think it adds a facet of fascination to it. In almost every mysterious and controversial event, from Jack the Ripper to the assassination of John F. Kennedy, you can, if you look hard enough, find Masonic involvement. We know who killed JFK. We know what happened at Area 51. Don't ask. Those conspiracy theories have been out there for a long time. Uh, I think part of it is the fact that we've never been out front and open about what we're doing. Now, for the first time on television, we penetrate the marble walls of the Masonic Lodge. Witness secret rituals never before revealed to outsiders. Speak the unutterable password of the third degree and enter this long hidden realm of brotherhood and mystery, fellowship and death. As we explore and expose the secret world of the Freemasons. Enter the Masonic Lodge 
uh, and take the first introductory uh, pledges. First of all, they blindfold you, they put a noose around your neck, they bury your left chest, you roll up your left pants leg, take off your left shoe, kneel before the altar, and of course, you, know, you take these horrible oaths where you swear if you ever reveal anything uh, that uh, you have heard why in the first uh, degree, why they cut out your take out, tear out your tongue, cut your throat, bury you in the sands of the sea up to the level of your neck at low tide, so when the tide comes in, you're dead if you're not already dead. Second degree, of course, they cut out your entrails and burn them and feed them to the birds of the air. Third degree, uh, they cut out your heart. I mean, it's, by the fourth degree, things are really pretty bad. Adult men swear these oaths, but what you have to understand uh, is that as you're kneeling blindfolded uh, before the altar, before a Bible, a holy Bible, uh, the worshipful master asks you, what do you desire? And you are told to answer the light. You have no idea what the light is, uh, but you answer the light. In the second degree, you're told to ask for more light. And the third degree, you want even more light. Uh, many of you here, I suspect, are born-again Christians. And you, many of you have prayed the sinner's prayer. And when you pray the sinner's prayer, uh, something happens. Your, your life changes forevermore. I know this happened to me and it's happened to many people. Uh, but when the Mason uh, swears this oath, something happens to him too. For he has requested the light to come in and dominate his life. Now this is Albert Pike, the leading Masonic philosopher of the last century. And in his book, Morals and Dogma, which was given to every uh, Mason who advanced through the degrees uh, up until 1974. This was the Masonic Bible. And what Pike wrote on page 104, Masonry conceals its secrets from all the, except the adepts and the sages of the elect and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve to be misled to conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it. In other words, you ask for the light but we're not going to let you know what the light is. On page 819, the blue degrees are about the outer court of the portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed for the initiate, but he is intensely misled by false interpretation. It is not intended that he shall understand them, for it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts and the princes of masonry. The, on page 219, the right raises a corner of the veil even in the degree of apprentice for there declares that masonry is a worship so what are they worshiping during the templar trials members of the order described how initiates were required to perform bizarre sexual rites bestowing obscene kisses on the bodies of senior members they confessed to spitting and trampling on the cross and denying the divinity of jesus the accusations that have been leveled at the Templars are extremely lured, and I've always attracted, for that reason, a great deal of attention. But they are there in black and white in the trial depositions, so we have to address them and, and assess them. But most shocking of all was the testimony that the Templars worshipped a sinister bearded head. In the trials, the head was described in various different ways. Sometimes they said it had two heads. Sometimes brothers described it as having four feet. Some said it was made of silver. Some said it was made of gold. It was rumored to be the preserved head of the first Templar Grand Master, Hugh de Payen. It was also described as a two-faced skull or the head of an animal. Some mentioned a weird idol known as Baphomet. It's possible the word Baphomet was a corrupted pronunciation of Mohammed. If so, some have suggested this is evidence that the Templars were secret converts to Islam. In the 12th century, the Muslim culture, the Muslim civilization was very ahead of the Western European uh, civilization. When the Knights Templar went to the Holy Lands, they were uh, confronted with a culture that was very superior to their own. So some influences began to settle in the general ideology of the Templars. Well, on pages 839 and 840 uh, of Morals and Dogma, and I'm just going to take the bottom paragraph because this is the important one. It was the remembrance of this scientific and religious absolute, the absolute is capitalized, reflecting deity. 
of this doctrine that is summed up in a word of this word, capital W, deity. In fine, alternately lost and found again, that was transmitted to the elect of all ancient initiations. It was this same remembrance preserved, or perhaps profaned, in the celebrated order of the Templars that became for all secret associations of the Rosy Cross, that's the Rosicrucians, of the Illuminati, and of the Hermetic Freemasons, the reason of their strange rites, of their signs more or less conventional, and above all, of their mutual devotedness and of their power. In other words, if you get into these things, you will get power, power that you cannot believe, and you will have great wealth. But at what cost? Well. When I went through Professor Quigley's papers, and uh, of course we found the interview with him uh, that we've already discussed, and if you get the interview, you'll actually hear him talking about these crazy right-wingers who come to him, and they show him that symbol, and they tell him that's the symbol of the Illuminati. And he said, that's not the symbol of the Illuminati. That's been around for 5,000 years. That's the symbol of the, uh, the, the mystery religions of antiquity, and that's what it really is. This is the symbol uh, of the mystery religions of Persia and Babylon and, and, and Egypt. Uh, this goes back to the ancient pagan religions, uh, which are the basis of all modern-day secret societies. And every single one of them ties into this. Now, uh, you recall that we were talking about the Knights Templar. What were the Knights Templar? They were a religious order that in the... Um, Oh, uh, about 1,000, 1,100 went on the Crusades, and they were to guard the temple, where once it stood, Solomon's Temple, Temple Square, where today uh, the great mosque of Almar is. But there, of course, they came in contact uh, with people who were part of the mystery religions. And they came back to Europe uh, in the 1,200s, and they became the most significant financial force in Europe. They became the bankers of Europe. And using a fractional reserve banking system, uh, all of the monarchies of Europe became indebted to them, just as governments today spend more than they have. So in those days, they spent more than they had, and the Templars dominated what was going on. But, uh, of course, then it was discovered uh, that the Templars were Luciferian, and Jacques de Molay, their leader, uh, was burned at the stake in the early 1300s. Uh, of course, today, the uh, young people who are sons of, of Masons belong to the de Molays, as did uh, Bill Clinton. <laughs> Let me read again, page 321 of Morals and Dogma, uh, why uh, Pike lays it right out. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light, and with its splendors intolerable, blinds feeble, sensual or selfish souls? Doubt it not. Why, it's simply Luciferianism. If you read Manly P. Hall's a book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, uh, he's very, very clear what it's about. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. That's what it's all about. It's Luciferianism. If you watched the last video, you would have seen how your oppressors were able to steal your land, steal your freedom, steal your name, steal your father's name, and steal your heritage. But for some strange reason, you thought that they wouldn't steal your religion. How is that possible? You see, the matrix dictates that there must be an illusion of choice, even in the confines of slavery. Your current oppressors learned the secrets of ancient Kabbalah, where they are able to control the hearts of men through sorcery, witchcraft, and alchemy. The Knight Templars got a hold of the keys of the world's kingdom. You know those keys that Hasatan tried to tempt Yahusha with on the mountain, promised that he will give him the whole world unless he did one thing, bow down and worship him. The Templars did exactly that. They bow down. They worship. The link between the Catholic Church and Freemasonry is an easy one. The Knights Templar was 
a Vatican religious and military order for the protection of the pilgrims to the Holy Land. Founded as the Poor Knights of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon in 1118, there are well documented sources from their own followers detailing their inherent spiritual ties between the two. Freemasonry is a work in front of the Knights Templar order, the Jesuits, the Rosicrucians, who all came out of the Roman Catholic Church. The very term Freemason is derived from a period in time during the Renaissance where a group of Masons, primarily those affiliated with the Templars, built most of the cathedrals in all of Rome and Europe, along with all the other architectural edifices that you will see scattered across that region of the world. You see, the Templars became powerful and wealthy. Their arrogance towards the rulers, together with their wealth and their rivalry with the Knights Hospitallers, led to their downfall. The order was violently suppressed in 1312 by the King of France and tentatively also by the Roman Catholic Church. Many of its possessions were then given to the rival Hospitallers, also known as the Knights of Malta. To survive and to get revenge, the Knights Templars divided into secret stonemason lodges and other newly established orders. First, it was the Jesuit order, then came the Rosicrucian order, and then all the other Freemasonry orders that are still present today. But the order that is of the most interest for this topic of our founding religious fathers is the Rosicrucians. For out of this order came a following that would shock the Christian Catholic world. The Protestant Reformation. The founding father, the founding father of the Reformation was none other than the head warlock of the Rosicrucian order himself, Martin Luther. The Rosicrucians believed heavily in the symbolisms of Siegel magic and alchemy and on the very crest and seal of the Rosicrucian order is Martin Luther's initial. That's why so many church ministers, elders in Protestant churches, were Freemasons in the last 400 years. Even today, there are 1.3 million Freemasons in Southern Baptist Convention alone, all of whom revere the acclaimed Prince of Preachers, one of the biggest Freemasonries. Charles 33 to Haddon Freemasons Spurgeon. make a Luciferian covenant with the devil. It's a satanic secret society. months later he walked past Garvey in 1918 Garvey is on top of some steps preaching <laughs> preaching about Pan-Africanism and he said the spirit of Africa hit him this is John Bruce Britt and he said he looked in Garvey's eyes and saw that he was serious Woo! and that's when the UNIA took off because John Bruce Britt brought Garvey in and he said you want to get black people you want to organize black people? I will show you how, right? But you have to become a Mason. Oh yes, he became a Mason. And then now, now I'm going to get all these pseudo uh, untrained 
the hell with them. Don't pay them talking. no mind. Keep going. Right, but they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Don't pay them right. no mind. <laughs> Keep going. Told him if you want black America, the black America that you saw when you were in the South, the only way you're going to get them is that you're going to give them through the Masons because all the black churches were Masons. They were Masons. All the black pastors, which are had the core of about 10 million black people in their head. And when Garvey became a Mason in New York, it was over with. Mm. It was over with. Once he became a Mason, it was all about retaking the continent of Africa. Because you had more than 100,000 black soldiers who had fought in World War I, who were militarily prepared to go to war and die. They had fought killing white people in Germany. They, they were being lynched, so they had no problem with killing white people in America. This is the real Marcus Garvey in the UNIA. And once he became a Mason, the whole black world, the center of black America, the most pan-Africanist group of black people in the world gave him whatever he needed. He set up the Negro factory leaves. He set up the Black Star Line and millions of dollars came from all over the black world. Many have asked, is Haile Selassie I a Mason? Well, we know he is crowned the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah in Ethiopia. But he's also given all these other titles, such as Grand Cordon of the Order of Solomon, Knight Grand Cross of the Order of Solomon, Knight of the Garter, Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath, Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, Royal Victorian Chain, Field Marshal of the British Army, the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic, the Order of the Golden Lion, Luxembourg, the Order of the Seraphine, Sweden, the Order of the Elephant in Denmark. So all these titles and orders have been accepted by His Majesty, and we see here at the top of the structure the Knights Templar garb and regalia, and many different regalias that His Majesty can often be seen in. This may be a Master Mason's regalia. Here as we look upon the jewels and the garments of a Knights Templar, we see striking similarities between the garb of Haile Selassie and his regalia and jewels. Could this be because Haile Selassie is a Mason or a son of Maat? Possibly so. We see him here adorned with the plumed hat, which is most certainly related to the plumed or feathered serpent. And we see that in the Knights Templar's regalia. Here he is with Queen Elizabeth. If you study these jewels and regalia that adorn His Majesty's outfit, you'll see they're the same or quite similar to the jewels of Knights Templar's outfits. Henry H. Lead. There you go. There you go. The Lions are a Masonic organization. We'll be showing proof on that in the future. Uh, definitely comes from masonry created by mason um member of muddy creek evangelical lutheran church so elca but again lutheran uh member of council blah blah blah, blah. member of effort of lodge 665 free and accepted masons since 1951 the lodge up along route 322 and hershey is lodge number 666 i have a video of that showing that how many people know of charles finney um yeah, I know you do. We have several books from him. He was a revivalist back in the um, 1830s, about. Um, he's written some amazing um, books up about God, about, on revival, just an amazing man of God. Um, and I, we're especially drawn to some of the old timers because um, they, they just spoke truth so boldly. 
Well, Charles Finney, Finney was, um, God actually used him to bring revival in America, um, very powerful revival. He's said to have over five, 500,000 converts um, to Christianity from other, like this isn't from Lutheranism to, you know, something else. This is unbelievers who came to know Jesus Christ. Um, interestingly, he was also a Freemason. That is, that is until he met Jesus. Um, he experienced actually a dramatic um, conversion to Christianity. It's very fun to read what happened to him. But he, at the time, he didn't realize, he had been in Freemasonry for about four years, and he didn't realize that it was evil. But soon after he came to faith in Christ, he had a lodge meeting. So he went to the lodge meeting, and he was asked to open and close in prayer, which he did in Jesus' name, because now he was a Christian. Um, and he said as soon as he closed the prayer, something Holy Spirit um, came on him, and, and he realized at that moment he couldn't have anything to do with the lodge or anything that it represented. Um, and he, in fact, after that, and that first, that only meeting that he went to after coming to know Jesus, he said he experienced, everything he experienced at the lodge was monstrously profane and barbarous. But he had been blinded to it before that. Um, he was alarmed, he said, at his own ignorance to how much had been imposed on him by masonry. And as he prayed, he said, Holy Spirit took him into a time of reflection and examination and earnest prayer. He knew he had to leave Freemasonry behind. And his, um, he said his new life in Christ instinctively and irresistibly recoiled him from having any fellowship with what the Lord revealed to him as unfruitful works of darkness. Okay. There goes the Scottish Rite Temple, and Freemason Temple, and what's right over here? Oh, a First Pentecostal Church. <clears throat> I'm going to show you a, a Freemason place I find in our own ways. Tell me what you think. And you can see what the fruits were of that. Amy was eventually given money from the organization, such as the Salvation Army, which she actually worked for quite a bit and helped them a lot with organizing and moving money around. Um, but the Salvation Army has always been a front for specific money being moved around for individuals and in various churches and organizations. Um, she was able to purchase real estate property near Echo Park in Los Angeles, where she had much of her funds uh, from that particular organization moving around money through these orgs such as the Salvation Army and a lot of supporters to help fund her and build the Angeles Temple. Now, as we get into Amy and her particular gifts in healing and her fake aspect behind things, we got to understand the charismatic movement. The charismatic movement is basically the movement of speaking in tongues. Now, in 1964, there were three steps of, in of infiltration um, that was revealed in documents. One was destroy the fundamental church of any kind and the structure therein with the basic salvation plan of Jesus Christ. The second one was the Freemasonry infiltration into the church. And the third was the political secret government for total takeover on um, using ecumenism as one of those tools. If you, if you can see into all of the stupid and crazy stuff that's going on in this world today, if you can see how so many saints are so deceived and compromised, they don't even know where they are. They don't even know what country they live in. They don't even understand the nature of our responsibility as believers in a, in a uh, republic. I was listening to the preacher the other night. And he said, you know, there were two foundations that this country was established on. Uh, uh, there were Christians that came. And then there were those who were Masonic Masons and like George Washington and others, they were not truly believers. Let me tell you something. Let me, let me get the record straight right here. George Washington may have been a, 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 a Masonic Lodge, 
a member. Uh, Thomas Jefferson may have been a mason. And all that. But let me tell you, half the preachers in this city are too. Oh, uh oh. Half the preachers in this city ascribe to secret orders. Uh oh. And Eastern stars. Uh oh. And the children of the court. And they're preaching the gospel. Uh oh. Uh oh. So get off of George Washington. Get off of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> get on these preachers every Sunday morning. They are, they, and some of them bowling up the way of rings. So get on with the founders. Get on the, the ones that are here today. Amen. That think Jesus Christ is not enough. Get on those today who's preaching. You got to have a, a membership here in order to get along in society. You got to be able to get that lion's claw. You got to be able to raise people from the dead with, in, in, a, in a time. You got to be able to uh, be able to start a fire in a way that the trains can stop for you. You got to be able to do all of these things that masons do at the 32nd, 33rd degree and drink blood out of the skull. My Lord. My Lord. And ride the goat. Yes. Yes. And know who's in the side of the north. <laughs> preachers in this city. I, I'm not just talking about Baptist or Presbyterian and Episcopalian. I'm talking about Pentecostal preachers. I know a Pentecostal bishop that wears his rain all the time. Trinidad and Tobago. Joining us on set, Jerome Herrera. We're talking about the Freemason Society of Trinidad and Tobago, the United Grand Lodge, 300th anniversary. Well, the history and the beginning, according to some, dates 
way back to the days of the Egyptians. And that's how it started as society, the Freemasons, a lodge, a society shrouded and embedded in secrecy. Well, now it seems as though they are not as secret as we'd like them or we would like to think that they are. A lot of people have described them as a cult, a secret society with secret rituals. And uh, even some have gone to say so far that they control the pace of the earth and the, and the major political institutions on the planet. Jerome, good morning. How are you? Morning. Thank you for being well, having me here. Taking the conspiracy theory <laughs> taking, out of it. Taking the conspiracy theory out of it, yes. Who are the Freemasons? Well, let me just firstly start this, um, to make it clear that we are not a cult, right? Um, we are just a fraternal organization of uh, men who basically don't have any affiliation to any religious or political bodies. But in fact, we're just here to really en to endorse what we believe, which is brotherly love, relief, and truth. That, in essence, is basically a focus on kindness, fairness, integrity, honesty. I mean, I could go on, but... In the 21st century, is it still an all-boys club? All boys, no. All boys, no. We, there's two distinct, I want to I be very clear on that. Our, the United Grand Lodge of England is a society where the men join. And there, 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 there are no women within that particular order. However, there are other societies that also have the Freemasons concept within it, but also strictly women orders. And one of them, is example, is one where formed in 1919, which is the Honorable Fraternity of Ancient Freemasons. That is in England. And there are others that are all over the globe, Brazil, America, and the United Kingdom. What is the purpose of it? Is it simply a frat, an old boys fraternity? You talk about respect, brotherly love, all mm -hmm. of the support, networking. You know, that's a very interesting question. Well, what what is I, the objective? What is the end motive of this organization? When I first heard about this organization, I, I was kind of intrigued by all the rumors etc that was going on i mean yeah there's, there's the networks and the, there's all kind of conspiracies gfk killing and all kind of madness such as that right and then i remember what dr fitzgerald batiste deceased who told me once he said you know um people in general what they don't understand they fear and what they fear they either ostracize demonize terminate and uh, it made me want to understand what it is because the truth will always come out to people who want to see it, the brave and the bold. So I, when, I, when I looked at it, I realized that Freemasonry in essence is what we say it is. It's really and truly a society that when you come together, camaraderie, it's not to really and truly raise your station or, 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 or to, to, to make you a superstructure, but really and truly it is there to make you a better man. How does it do that? You know, a lot of people see it as a networking tool, and I say that some of the greatest leaders on the planet. Uh, you have the lines of American presidents have all been associated with very, the Masonic movement. Very true, very true. Winston Churchill, etc. But the other simple ones, like myself, for example, right? <laughs> um, there's also Nat King Cole, mm -hmm. who was amazing. And uh, a lot of musicians, there's Clive Lloyd, who was one, uh, uh, our old cricketer from the West Indies. But it really focuses on what we have a saying, which is make good men better. And in doing so, I realized that within the last year, which was basically, what is a good man? Or how we could, as Masons, make you a better person. And better person means that you have to be a better caregiver, father, husband. How is it benefit to you? Well, as me, me, they're definitely more patient, more tolerant, understanding to, understanding to people where who don't sh share your same nurse your religious values, but who actually have some form of common moorings with what you look at, or which you, how you feel about society, or you feel about women, or you feel about sons, or you feel about children. Or you, you make it your thing. seem like a one love movement, but yet there are all these, uh, all these stories about becoming a member, uh, that you have to go through these rites, these rituals, and it's a huge screening process. You have to be asked, you have to be approved, well, that is true. There's, there's, there's a part where <laughs> so I can't come be, and say, you know, I want to be one of the be, females in the Masons. You can. You can. And I just, I just told you what, what you can do. You could actually go to organizations which are Freemasons for strictly women. And actually, I'm trying to encourage women of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, someone who I actually speak to, to really and truly ask that particular order, which I just referred to. And you can actually, they are online right now, which is hfaf.org.uk. Find them and ask if you could come down. Because I, I understand that they were in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. or they have tried to reach Jamaica. And Trinidad Bego, I think a lot of people have been interested in it. 
I say hope so. You you having an interfaith service? Uh, a lot of people think of it, and you started off. It's not a cult. Um, as religion and the Freemason movements do not go together, what is the interfaith service about? Well, you're, that the religion, we, we are not a religious organization. I'll say that one, one more time. But because it's an interfaith service, we acknowledge as Masons, so you must have a belief in a higher being. And we have, we have brothers of people who are of different faiths, Hindu, Baha'i, Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, etc. All these faiths actually come here to really explore themselves on a moral basis, not spiritual. Spiritual connotes exactly what religion or faith you adhere to. But your morals is something that's different. Your morals is something that's more innate. And I say innate because you as a man will know exactly, okay, thou shalt not kill. And that goes basically across the board of most faiths. So the interfaith service really and truly is where we can come together and really, and really give thanks to the 300 years that we are celebrating for all people of the different faiths. So it's not 300 years of world domination? No. <laughs> uh, and this is really about demystifying uh, what's taking place um, in the Masonic movement. How many Masons do you have in Trinidad and Tobago? We have over a thousand members in Trinidad and Tobago. And they are? Thereabouts. And when you think of the Masonic movement, Jerome, you normally think of people who are in the upper echelons of society, that they are the movers and the shakers and those that shape the direction. I mean, you, you've read the stories from the days of the building of the, the pyramids, that they were the ones that kept the secret as to how they were built. That is true. But um, I realize you read a lot about this thing, which is very good. I like that. And the thing I read is, a lot about a lot of things. <laughs> that we know, eh? And what we what I could say this to you is that yes, there are masons who are at the upper echelons of society. That is that is this reality. But the other fortunate reality is this. There are masons who are not there. We cater from people who are the of the highest spoke of fortune speed, also to the lowest spoke of fortune speed. It's really open to everyone who is intrigued and interested in making themselves a better person. Closing comments from Nancy, it's about interfaith service and demystifying the mystery of the mysterious Mason. I will say this, but I want you to be able to understand that. What you could do is actually don't take my word for it. Go online and do your own research. Is United Grand Lodge of England has their own website, ugle.org.uk. And there's also a series called Inside the Freemasons on Sky Series. And go and look at it and the interfaith service. I encourage everybody to come. It's open to the, to the public. And you don't have any strange rituals? No. Not strange. And strange is actually quite subjective, isn't it? But it's a ritual where it's plays that we carry on to show exactly what you go through in various stages of your life. And there are no rituals attached. You know, there are rumors about uh, Eric Williams, who is a Mason. As I know, Eric Williams is what, not a Mason. Dr. Eric Williams, the Honorable Prime Minister, was not a Mason. Hmm. Something you learn every single day. Jerome Herrera telling us a little bit about the, the Masonic movement in Trinidad and Spain. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light and with his splendors and palpable, blinds people, sensual or selfish souls? Doubt it not. Why, it's simply Luciferian. Based on if you have a godfather in high places in the force, or if you're having a sexual relationship with someone yeah. of power in the force, and that people are just demotivated because it's not based on merit. Is that so? Well, that, yes, you have a large percentage of that that is taking place in the force. Large, large percentage. I remember when I was an inspector, waiting about, not rod as sergeant, waiting for almost 15 years to be promoted. And then Macmillan came in and I made my observation to him. You know, when I checked the record at the time, the last five from a commissioner of police happened to be large people. 
And I'm saying in a small population as a large does in Jamaica. How can the last five commissioners of police could have been promoted to the rank of commissioner? And when I investigated and found out that organization, right, it would seem to me, based on some evidence, had great influence on the force as to who became commissioner at that time. And it persists on that it has spread. As you made mention of some sexual connotation, friends, the church, the bar, we drink together, who carry the most news, who carry the best news, who is most destructive to one another. And we end up, the converse is also true. We have other people that I would call scraping you put in a round hole. Are you want me to observe the converse? You have the round hole that you put in scraping also. Well, Granny, tell me, friend, don't trip. So from the other day, you see, friend, we don't trip. A family we say because and everything we come and show to it. And your friend, first, if you're making money, all leave enough. Last them way is like the sheep, back a nickel, bow peep. Watch them kill and even quit. Don't sleep. Got them in your desk if you won't see it. <laughs> boy, 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 boy. Let me just state this disclaimer right now. I don't believe that all pastors are Freemasons. Many of you are really doing the Lord's work. You don't understand where the origins of your faith is from, but in your heart, you are living, some of you are living the life. Some of you honestly are trying and doing the best that you can to please the Most High. And the Most High will honor you for that. I'm not one of these far right or far leftists uh, that you can fit into any of, of these camps, especially those ICUI Freemason camps. That's right, I said it. Freemason camps. I believe that still the truth must be told. So I'm praying still that you will if you're listening to this now that you'll open your eyes 
and see how many of your religious practices are linked with Freemasonry. And I'm going to employ you through these sets of series uh, to do some self-examination about your faith, your walk with him, if you're serving him by his right name, if you're serving him the right way. Are you a grace abuser and not a commandment keeper? Are you practicing the are you practicing what the most high said you should be practicing? And I'm, I'm not talking about those old ceremonial laws. Because when you read Revelations, it's clear. Only those who keep his commandments and are washed by the blood of Yahusha will enter. The two, they're necessary. You cannot separate them. So for those of you who are keeping the commandments alone, you're lost. And for those of you who are relying on Yahusha's grace and blood, his perfect work on Calvary, alone, you're lost too. Because he said, if you love me, this is what Yahusha said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The two go hand in hand. Especially in today's time where there are so many lawbreakers, truce breakers, and the law is being twisted to favor immorality. The homosexuals run the show now. Since they were in the relationship, I realized that he started to get a little... It's know. all about the age of tolerance. But everyone seems to be tolerant to everything but the truth. I implore you now, Listen to this series with an open mind and an open eye and let your heart receive this word with joy and gladness. It's time for you to, if you're in a church right now, it's time for you to evaluate if you are following the right and correct doctrines of the Most High. If you're comfortable where you are, then fine, stay. If your pastor hasn't been infiltrated by some of these Freemasonry doctrines, then fine, stay. But if after doing your own research and you have discovered that there's a lot found wanting, many answers go a begging, and your pastor cannot give an account for his faith and yours, then you must leave. What has become clear is that there was only one religion one faith and one God and his name is Yah it's also been proven that we are Yah's chosen people and when we were taken from the coast of Africa Negro land we had our own faith that one faith, that one religion. Now it's funny, our oppressors took that religion and mix it with their pagan faith. If you take a drop of pure water and you dilute it with anything, it becomes impure. It becomes compromised. My brethren, we have been compromised. We have been diluted. Through religion, we have been bamboozled and tricked. And instead of serving the Most High with our whole heart, we curse ourselves daily with pagan religious worship. Now I came from a strong Christian background and I'm thankful for that foundation because many of you who are waking up now without this foundation, you're lost. So there's no graduation or easy transition Bristol into the Sammy Hebrew faith for you. You're a bunch of hate mongers. And don't, don't worry, the Most High will deal with you shortly. The rebels he promised he would purge out. To my Caribbean brothers, how easy it is for us 
to frolic on the weekend and go to church this Sunday morning and pretend as if everything is going to be okay. If you're honest with yourself, Christianity in the Caribbean is widely accepted. The world loves us. But the Most High made it perfectly clear. How can they love you if they hate me? <laughs> so if they love you, that means both of you have the same father. You have to examine especially those Christians who constantly get awards from the world. Who constantly are being reverenced and respected by the world. When Yah calls you a peculiar people. Which means you're weird, you're different, you're set apart. The time has come now where there will be no more fence riders. You're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to choose. Am I with Yah or am I with the world? Am I going to stand for righteousness? Or am I going to fall for every whim that the government puts before me? Whether it's gay rights. The right to marry another man. Abortion. I mean, we, 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 we celebrate abortionists now, child murderers. As soon as you look, we're, we're now going to be celeb celebrating pedophile and pedophilia. The Caribbean we know or we have known before has changed. And it's been destined to be this way. Because the 400 years is up. And it's time for us to go. Yah is waking up his people and he is consecrating our hearts to be disciplined followers, to be fervent followers, to hearken unto his word, not to be hearers only, but to be doers as well. And to tell this form of Christianity that abuses grace, Yahusha's grace, to go to hell. <laughs>